release it. So they do the transactional VOD first. And we're still at that stage where people kind of have to look for it and rent it. And eventually, you know, we'll move into other, other areas. But I think I, all the timelines are mixed up now. <laughs> and, uh, well, we're on, not mixed uh, up. How, we're, how movies are being we're not mixed up. In Good. <laughs> where to go see it. And with that, so hi, this is Brian Sebastian, Movie Review Some More, Worldwide TV Network, Women on TV. iTube 247 out of Franklin, Tennessee, and iHeartRadio and all the different platforms around the world. And yes, in this show, I'm in our guest's bedroom because it's too noisy out there. So I'm doing whatever I can because this is an important mm -hmm. film. April, tell us who you are uh, and what this film is, because this is a really, really good film, and I want to keep it out there. Thank you. Uh, I'm April Wright, and I'm the director of Stunt Women, The Untold Hollywood Story. Talk about how this came about, because I love the story on this. Uh, so totally underrated. It's an excellent film. <laughs> Call it, I, I gave it the four E's. We have our own rating system at Movie Reviews and More. It's entertaining, it's exciting, it's emotional, and it's engaging. And that's a five star wow. comes to that. That's what this movie is. And again, I've been wanting to talk to you since last September on this because I want people to see this film because it's a, such a, a wonderful piece of work. Thank you. Well, what I, I'd made other documentaries. I made one about drive-in movie theaters and I made one about movie palaces and both of those covered history of cinema. And um, that's what this one did as well. But what I liked about this one being a woman filmmaker is I felt like it really told the story of all of us, how a lot of women were involved in cinema in the really early days of silent films and all that. And then they kind of got pushed aside and uh, men took over everything, including in the stunt business. They were putting on wigs to double for women. Um, and uh, and uh, a lot of struggles have happened over the years. But when you watch this film, you have no doubt that women are capable and amazing and that they can do it. And I think that that speaks for the whole industry and in changing some of the statistics overall. So, so that's what I really loved about it. And also what you said about entertaining and exciting and engaging. That's what I set out to do. I, I want to make an emotional you know, commercial energy. because of what the girls yeah, and women have and gone through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got to land emotionally. But I kept saying the whole time that we wanted to make an action documentary. So I mashed up those two genres. I don't know if I invented that or not, but that was what we kept saying was we want to have as few. We do have some talking heads, but we have as few as possible. And we really try to, you know, fill, put the film in into the action as much as we can because if we if we told it a boring way, it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be the right story for these women. So we had to tell the story the way that they live. Well, and also the good thing about that, you told you told a little bit of the black perspective of things too. Uh, that's even more important because I remember talking to Pam Greer back in the day of, of how tough she was. The guys liked her back in the black sex abortion because she was doing these. And then it turns out, yeah, you know what? There's always someone behind the scenes that's not getting credit. You know, one of my good friends, John Stewart, yeah. stunt person, he did the Power Ranger stuff. You know, he's moved to Florida. He's on the music side of stuff. And I always make sure that people know how he started. Lo and behold, this past summer, Quentin Tarantino saw his movie he did 25 years ago. And Alamo Drafthouse put it back out there, went on Netflix, and it got a whole, like, he never would have seen this because it was real stunts. And I said, you know what? I got to get April yeah. on. I got to get, I was there when Michelle <laughs> first started, uh, and, you know, when she was homeless, you know, and then she's discovered at Sundance and everything. So I thought she was a great pick for this because Michelle is a tough girl. Yeah. Well, let, let me go on both your topics. So first off, the, the black stunt people, yes, they've had their own struggles. And we had J.D. David in the film, who is a pioneer, who doubled Pam Greer in most of her films. And she talks in the documentary about that struggle and about how when the Black Stuntmen's Association was formed, 
that it had women as members because they understood that the struggle was real and that it was similar for women and for people of color to, you know, get those jobs. And so, you know, they've been kind of side by side together throughout this. And, and even today, the struggle is still there, even though things are a lot better, um, you know, it's still happening a little bit. Um, and now Michelle, she was great to be involved in the film and, and we wanted to have somebody, you know, initially to narrate, but when they got us in touch with Michelle and she had been such an advocate for stunt people getting credit, she had spoken out um, before about this topic. And she basically told me, you know, whatever you want me to do, this is something I love and I respect these women and I want to do it. So we found ways to integrate her into the film. And one of my favorite shoot days was when we put her in the car with her, uh, stunt driver from all the fast and furious films. And we actually shot some drift car racing for the film, which was, you know, amazing. And so much fun for me to be shooting a scene like that for a documentary, but also working with some of the top people in the business. I, I learned so much and it was really fun. When you're doing your research and putting this all together, what didn't you know and what surprised you about putting this whole project together? Because I always tell people, if you want to be a filmmaker and you want to go into documentaries, because Ken Byrne is a friend, you know, I'm there for a lot of these people and I respect their art. I could never do what you guys do. That's not my passion. My passion is to get the interviews and to tell the story and how people go see those movies now, watch them in the home. This is where I'm good at doing. Talk about that. What did you know about that? Because the average documentary still takes seven years to do. People don't realize that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they take a long time. Well, the two things I always say, you know, one is obviously passion. You have to kind of fall in love with your subject because you have to do so much research, get to know it so well and live with it for so long through the editing and process through everything. So you have to find topics you're passionate about. And this is a topic that I am passionate about. Uh, and also, I think you really have to get involved with the community. Whatever story you're telling, you have to get to know them. You have to listen because I'm making a film, but it's their life. It's their livelihood. And so I have to tell their story truthfully and honestly and, and the right way that they want it to be told. And so I think that's a really important thing is to, to try to tell the story from the inside out the way that the people who, you know, in this case, the stunt women, the way that they need to be seen. Um, so that's a big thing. In, in the case of this, there was a book written um, that the documentary started with and the producers had optioned the book. So the book had done some of the early research, you know, like I didn't know about how pervasive women were in silent films and that there were all these serials like Hazards of Helen had almost 100 episodes of women, you know, jumping from bridges onto moving trains and grabbing, you know, moving, you know, planes by a ladder. They were doing that 100 years ago, which is crazy. So I didn't know that. But the book went up to about 2007. So I also had to do a lot of uh, research to bring the film up to the present day and to make sure that I included yeah, as many of the top stunt women in the field today as I could. <laughs> so I had to do a lot of, you know, extra research and, and just get to know a lot of the women um, in this community. So it, it was fun and it's just been inspiring to get to know them. What made you want to pick up and actually decide to do this? Because as you said, you got to really love it. What was something that said, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do this and I got to be the one to do it. Uh, it was a combination. I, I had um, I had known one stunt woman for a while. Um, and then I met Amy Johnston through her boyfriend. She's one of the women that's in the film. And um, and she and I wanted to work on something together. And then also around that same time, I had lunch with my friend Svetlana Svetko and she um, yeah. is a cinematographer known for documentaries. She she shot Inside Job, which won the Oscar. She and I wanted to work on something together. And then a couple of the producers who optioned the book, I knew them and they came to me with the book. So it was almost like all these things just lined up, uh, you know, sort of knowing Amy and thinking about stunt women and knowing a good female DP and and then the book. And so everything kind of came together. And then one of the ideas that, that I had was to bring the book to life um, by following some of the younger stunt women as they meet the living legends, the, the women that were doing it in the 60s and the 70s, so they could hear the stories firsthand. And once we kind of had that idea, you know, then we got financed, we made it independently. 
and uh, and everything got rolling. So I, I just kind of felt like, you know, it, it was just everything about it was the right thing for me and the right timing. It's always interesting what might not fit, but that's a good piece of film or footage that you got that you couldn't get into film. I'm sure you had something. What was it? Oh, there's so much that that didn't get in there or that we could expand. You know, uh, I, I would love if this could be made into a whole docu series and we could even get more in depth into all the topics. Like, for example, uh, when the, we set a have a girl set on fire, um, Kelly Roy's and gets set on fire in the film, and we show sort of the basic steps, but we spend maybe you know under a minute on it yeah. when there when there's actually all these steps that they you know they dip the clothes in ice cold water before they put them on and they do all these other things and you can't breathe in while you're on fire because your lungs will get it you know there's all this technique um, so a lot of topics just to sort of cover everything um you know we just had to sort of give them this much and then you know it really could have been you know 15 minutes that we spent on that topic it's so interesting and we didn't get into uh we we had a section about being mothers um debbie evans was talking about how doing a motorcycle jump while she was pregnant and stuff like that and how angela merrill uh, didn't tell anyone she was pregnant and kept it, you know, secret and didn't want anybody to know about her daughter because she didn't want to not work because of that. Absolutely. And uh, Don, yeah, and Donna Keegan, you know, she uh, did that hanging motorcycle, uh, sorry, hanging helicopter stunt in True Lies that she tells, you know, about in the film. She did another stunt like that later after she was a mother and she had different feelings about it. So, you know, that was a whole topic that we wanted to put in there and just at the end of the day, didn't have time. So yeah, there's a ton of stuff like that, 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 uh, that's fascinating that uh, hopefully, you know, people get to see someday. <laughs> Where did your love of filmmaking come? What made you want it to be a director? Oh, I just, I had a film family. Um, my parents both loved films. My dad had an eight millimeter camera at home and we had reel to reel editing equipment and a, you know, a little projector. So, so I was always aware of the filmmaking process my whole life. And, and uh, you know, my mom loved films and would take us to things and explain to us what was good about them. And then as I got older, my brother and sister worked in a, an old neighborhood movie palace that was down the street from us. And, and I would just see every single movie that came out. So I, I knew I was going to um, get into filmmaking at some point. And, um, and I, I was worried about making money when I went to college. I, I studied computers and business and I, I had a career in that, um, which actually totally applies here too. But I switched into filmmaking um, like 12 years ago, um, roughly. And, um, and I'm so glad I did because it is the thing I was always passionate about. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like the story because again, I always tell a lot of the directors, the best editors were women at one point and all of a sudden they were cut off, but that doesn't mean they're still not talented because who scores says he's editor. She's a woman. Yeah. yeah. And Tarantino uh, had a woman editor. Um, she, she passed away a few years ago, but for most of his films, she had, he had, he had the same uh, female editor. So yeah. And, and I mean, editing is another form of directing. I, I, I edit um, uh, one of my other documentaries I edited myself and um, it, it, it is a, a skill that very much informs your filmmaking overall. Where did your, um, when did you do your other two films? because I don't think I've seen them and I'm disappointed that I haven't seen them. And I, I <laughs> those cases, no, I take that seriously because I'm a movie whore. No one's seen more movies than me since 19. 19- uh, the drive-in the drive one is on Amazon prime and a whole bunch of other places right now. Um, and that one I actually, actually released um, in eight years ago in 2013. And it played at a lot of drive-ins. I had a little theatrical run um, and, and the past year, it's had all this new attention because of drive-ins making such a comeback during the well, pandemic. Well, I recognized the title on it, and I was like, okay, so yeah. I'm going to watch it tonight on Amazon Prime because I'm disappointed. Yeah. Never got and, it. Then the, <laughs> and then the Movie Palace one, um, we also had, did a theatrical release because we were playing in a bunch of historic theaters and, and festivals. And then we got paused because of COVID and then it came out VOD a month after Stunt Women. So they, they both came out recently, um, both Stunt Women and the Movie Palace documentary. So you can find, both of those are still on the, you know, uh, transactional VOD. 
Okay, so explain what that means to people because when I'm doing my oh. my lose my yes. night shows, we're on 220 countries around the world. So I'm telling everybody, depending what territory, what state, what country you're in, like one of my okay. known um, coast is in British Columbia. On Netflix, she can't get American films something because Canada has more. I things. know they they do the border thing. everybody about these mm-hmm. things that that mm-hmm. that, and then like on the HBO Max, just because you were on Hulu, mm-hmm. the add-on, you weren't getting the streaming. So yes. on HBO Max, yes. this is me off. So so we're yeah. So for both both those films, for Stunt Women and the and the Movie Palace one, they both um, came out. It, it's called VOD, which is basically digital rental, so you can rent or buy it. Um, uh, and I think that's in a lot of places. Stunt Women also had a theatrical release in Japan, and I think they just um, released on Netflix in Japan. So you can look for Stunt Women there. In the U.S., um, it's if you look for it anywhere, I, I don't know how much the rental is. It's not very expensive, uh, but it's on Google Play, it's on iTunes and Apple TV and Amazon and okay. Fandango now. You can find both the films all of those places. At some point down the road, we'll probably be part of one of the, the subscription-based streamers, but we're still what they consider early in the release. So we're still on this um, you, you, you basically rent it to buy it, you know, rent it to watch it like a movie ticket. Uh, but, it, but it's, you know, less than a movie ticket. So talk about how was your year last year? Cause last year was my best year ever. And the reason for that, because I saw everything coming October 3rd of 2018. So I changed everything around. So I took just like a, a pilot would have been shot in a small town. I went to Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee to shoot our shows. Two of our films, one of them, uh, shows what is at 1 million 1.1 million views and still counting, not on YouTube. The other one's at a million, 150,000 and still counting. I, and I tell people, do you know anybody who's got shows outside of YouTube, not on a network that's got 1.1 <laughs> million views during a pandemic? And they go, no, I'm like, did anybody? And so that makes me reach out to these filmmakers because I want people to see your work. I don't care where they live because we have a great audience around the world. We reach Argentina where YouTube doesn't. So I want to make sure that they have access to that. So, and there's so many different platforms that it's hard to nail them down. Well, congratulations to you. That's awesome. I love hearing that, that you are able to be so productive in the lockdown. Um, that That's that's huge and that's great. Well, I, I, I think the, the thing about that is they, I, I tell people, I, you know, uh, I don't know what's, are you in Los Angeles? I'm in Los Angeles, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. so Bob and Greg Lemley, Lemley Theaters, those are my favorite theaters. My North Hollywood one was my favorite hangout. I want to make sure that these independent filmmakers, their films are seen by people. I know what it's right to win a film festival. When I'm helping Bloyd in Wisconsin or a Southern Woman in Film and Television in Tennessee or Roger Dowling, who I just got off the phone at Santa Barbara International Film Festival, they listen to what I'm saying because no one beats our numbers today. We have 7 million views a day in counting. Awesome. They go up well, and they never stop. And it's so, it- it's so important and, and it's so important and I appreciate you doing that to, to shine the light on some of these films that maybe don't have one of the bigger companies behind it to do all the marketing and to make sure you're aware of it. You know, all these films that, that we're talking about that I've made have all been made independently. And even though we've had distribution, you know, we're not on any of those big platforms yet that have so much marketing money to put into getting your attention on it. So this is important and, and I appreciate it. Yeah, it's awesome. I wanted to talk to you because it's important. Uh, again, when nobody has what we have around the world, I got, again, 13 women, all my co-hosts, I'm the lone black guy. And, you know, and my <laughs> film critic, he's gay. And we, we, we've been around for years doing all the junkets. And I said, nobody has what we have. So I can be that voice where you might not be reaching people because I want them to see your film. It's a great film. And I want to see the because two well, film festivals, their drivers have been key. They always do it. They didn't just start it. They've been doing yeah. it long. Well, Stunt Women, uh, Stunt Women, The Untold Hollywood Story is the name of it. And if you like films, if you like Marvel films, you know, there's so many action things, you know, Wonder Woman, um, all these things that that you don't know you're watching stunt people because it's yeah. so seamless and what they're doing is so amazing 
and you just see it as part of the character. And when you watch this film, it's really going to bring your appreciation of all those films that you already love to a deeper level because you're going to learn more about them and you're going to see a different side of this that you probably never even thought about. And, and even stunt men, you know, when people think of stunts, they think of stunt men and probably have no idea what women are doing. Um, and doing so well behind the scenes. So it's really gonna open people's eyes and, and it's inspirational, um, you know, making the film, but especially when I watch it, watch it with audiences, it kind of pumps you up. It makes you want to go do do something, whether it's work out or, or just, you know, go after some goal that you have. It's very inspirational too. Well, I, you know, um, six out of the 13 girls are in the world of fitness. Anyone who's uh, in the world of body, bigger, you know, building, whether you're a figure, bikini or whatever, they're part of our brand. And they go, oh, I want to go into the world of stunts. I'm like, you got to be prepared to do this. Your body's got to go. And because we've done stuff on the wrestling side. I grew up in Connecticut with WWF at that point, WWE. I was there when Hulk Hogan was going through his whole run of stuff. So I see their bodies later, the glorious ladies of wrestling. They're all my friends. So I know what they've been through. So this is just an added aspect of things. Why I appreciate the art, because I tell people, you really want to do this? You got to have that mindset, but also you got to control yeah. your body. What better movie than totally. yours, right? Yeah, they're they're professionals. I mean, there there is no doubt about it. They are absolute professionals in the field, and and they're professional athletes, really. That you know their their body is what they what they use, and it, you know it's amazing. It really is. What did you, what were you able to see why? Cause you had, I mean, that's amazing. You had two films coming out during COVID <laughs> for one. <laughs> what were you I know, right? When you were after the release of this, what were you watching film wise? Oh my gosh. Well, there's so many good documentaries. Um, I, I watched a lot of docs, but I also, I watched Queen's Gambit. <laughs> that was one of my, was my know, favorite no TV series now. last year. Yeah, no stunts in that one, but I but I did watch that. I think along with everybody else, I did watch Tiger King. I um, I watched Wonder Woman eighty four, of course, a couple times because a lot of stunt women that I knew did stunts in that film. So I really was watching those sections a few times to see what they had done. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just kind of like everybody consuming as as much as I can. I also um, do programming for Sundance Film Festival um, oh. for narrative for yeah, a lot of people don't know that. Um, I've been doing programming for narrative features for 16 years. So I did have a chunk of time during uh, COVID that, that I was just watching all these Sundance submissions. So I watched hundreds of Sundance films also. Um, I know what that process is like. So here's the thing. Yeah. Did the 10 minute rule. I've never done a 10 minute rule. I always watch it from getting to end because we have to watch the whole thing. We, we have to watch the whole thing and we do. Yeah. A lot of people don't. And I always tell people you've got to no matter what, because it's always fun to see where movies were made, who did the V, you know, ADR, um, all of these things, you know, casting, because I'm, I'm, again, helping the filmmakers and a lot of these upcoming actors and actresses watch those credits. You may get your future job from some of those things if you pay attention, as I did as a voiceover actor. Yeah, yeah, completely true. And and I think, you know, at least for Sundance, we're, we're looking at what the filmmaker set out to achieve and how well they executed that. So, so you want to see their whole vision all the way through to the end. So, Absolutely. you know, yeah. But, but, you know, like I was saying earlier, when you asked me about why I went into this field and how much I love films, I, I used to see every single film that was out there from the, the biggest blockbuster to the littlest indie film. Um, you know, the, when I was growing up, we didn't have, you know, internet, but you would look in the newspaper to see what is showing at the theaters. What do I want to go see? And there were times when I would open the newspaper and I would have seen every single film out, every single film. And then that I was would be me. like, okay, well, what, what do I want to see again? <laughs> yeah, well, but then it'd be like, what do I want to see again? And, and so training myself, you know, my whole life of seeing every film, no matter what it is, no matter what genre, no matter, you know, big, small, I think that's why, you know, it's, it's so enjoyable for me to, to watch all these Sundance films you know, whether they're awesome or whether they're somebody who's still learning or whatever it is, I still have enjoyment watching the whole thing and experiencing that. So 
Yeah. <laughs> Where did you grow up? Outside of Chicago. What part? Uh, way on the north uh, side of Chicago on the Wisconsin border, a little town called Zion is the town I grew up in. I know and where then it is. I live... You do? Yeah. Uh, we had Gary, Gary Coleman was from Zion. That's our, our, uh, <laughs> claim, to, our claim to fame. He was from Zion. Yeah. And, um, and then I lived in Oak Brook and then I lived um, downtown in the Printer's Row area in South Dearborn. And then after that, I moved out to, um, to L.A., and also growing up, um, one year during high school, I lived in Miami, Florida, because my mom was getting a degree at University of Miami. So we moved down there my sophomore year of high school. So I got a little Miami in me too. <laughs> what year did you move to California? In the 90s. Okay. Uh, was it early 90s or mid? Mid. Okay. So it was one of those things where I moved to, uh, from Connecticut to Los Angeles. I was, I was in radio. I was at Power 106. So um, we were going up against KISS, but I was also in the home video world. So I was going up against the blockbusters and Music Plus, the warehouses. So if you get a chance on Netflix to see the last, last, last blockbuster, because- Oh, I watched that already, yeah. That's where my world comes from. That's why we're good at what we're doing because that, that mode still works. You know, you had to go rent. You had to suggest those films. Quentin Tarantino, yep. Kevin Smith, and myself, we were the three that worked in video stores. That's our connection. They wanted mm -hmm. to be those directors, those ad, uh, our, ad, uh, actors, producers. I wanted to be what I did. When you came into the store, I would recommend you movies. And they had to be good because I had to watch everything as I was getting all my VHS tapes sent to me in the mail. So I would have a stack. 1991 was the year that I don't know how many movies I watched. 1992, right up till this year, I've been keeping track hand by hand ever since. How many I watched a month, what I saw uh, on home video. So I should always be seeing between 702 to 716 was the best I ever saw, I call on home video, meaning I saw it at home. Wow. It was sent to me or links like Stunt Woman. So that's how wow. I'm keeping up with stuff. So last year, I only saw, I saw, I saw, 1,836 films, that's TV shows last year, down 700. And I go, what? I didn't see that many? And the answer is because I didn't see a lot in the theater. I only saw three th movies in the theater last year. Invisible Man yep. was my last one. And that was the same day I was doing the documentary for the Herb Albert, uh, not Herb Albert, uh, mm -hmm. Mendez. And I did it at the Grammy Museum. So it was John Scheinfeld, the director, uh, he had that. He had the Herb Albert dog coming. So it was just four of us. We had the whole museum to ourselves. And I said, as soon as we walked out at 10 after nine, that's when everything was being shut down. Oh, wow. It's very, very I interesting. Was, so, so here's the posters of my film. Here's Stunt Women. Here's uh, Going Attractions, the definitive story, the movie palace. And then here's the Going Attractions drive-in movie. So the movie palace one, I was still playing in theaters um, when the last week before we shut down. And I was in Chicago playing at all these different cool historic theaters um, all around the city. Um, I was playing at the York and the Lake and the Tivoli and all these sort of uh, classic, classic old theaters. And um, and you could sort of see things starting to people were raiding all the grocery stores and like then the yeah. NBA shut down. And yeah. I was thinking, oh, my gosh, am I going to get stuck in Chicago? And not, you know, like we didn't know how quick things were going to shut down. And um, and same as you um, in the theater, I was playing at, at the lake in Chicago. Um, Invisible Man was also playing in a different theater than mine. And so I went in there and watched that. That was the last film besides my own that I saw before the shutdown happened. So exactly. yeah, Invisible Man was the last one I saw in a theater. Here's a tough question for you. Uh, we got about five minutes left. Are you ready to go back to the theaters to see a movie yet? Uh, they're, they just started opening in Los Angeles. Um, some haven't opened yet. I think uh, some of the landmarks and Lemleys are still opening soon, but a few have already opened. And I haven't yet, but I definitely will. I'm not afraid to go to a theater to see a film. I think the one of the challenges for me is something that, you know, you want to go see in the theater. Um, and there's a few that that even though I've already seen, um, like Nomadland, I've already seen, but because that one is so, you know, panoramic in the way yeah. it's shot, I would love to, to go see that one also in a theater. Um, so, so there are a few that, that I'm probably gonna go see. 
And stunt women is actually playing at uh, a drive-in at on on the Sunset Strip at the um, Andes Hotel. They have a parking lot in the back where they have a drive-in that they've been doing since the whole pandemic. And stunt women is actually playing there on uh, April 18th. So I am going to go see stunt women. Oh, women good for you! Oh, you know what? Um, a drive-in for a few weeks. I'm coming in the 19th. I'm in Vegas right now. I'm coming in the 19th because my studio is in Hollywood. So it, we built it during COVID. So. It's, our studio has been up and running because we keep it small. Because remember, I saw this coming. And so it's been very yeah. successful. So I've had a couple of the directors and everything come in because they loved it. But I've had a lot of more, more musicians come in. Right. Scott Page from Pink Floyd, uh, uh, Leland Scar from um, James Taylor, uh, Linda Rodstein, Phil Collins. So they've come in because they've got films coming out. So I've been working on pushing those ahead of time with that. Right. And, and you know what that's yeah, like. Yeah, I feel like, things, you know. I feel like things are starting to wake up. I'm very optimistic, very optimistic. Um, the other thing we should mention, um, Film Threat um, has awards for truly indie films, you know, that don't have any Netflix or Hulu or anything like that behind them. And we got, I got three awards. Um, we got one yeah. for Stunt Women for, uh, not uh, nominations, I should say. The awards are happening in a couple of weeks, but I, I got three nominations. So um, Stunt Women got nominated for Best Documentary. Uh, best sports documentary. Uh, and then I also got nominated for director of stunt women and then um, going attractions movie palaces got nominated for best um, indie documentary. So we have three, I have three nominations and the awards airs also on April 18th. So I don't know who's going to win yet, but I'm like, fingers crossed. Well, I get to push in my mind. I was there when Chris started film threat. <laughs> I remember those days. Cause I, that's when I started a, uh, my thing on, um, uh, I forgot what the, the TV, it was on, you remember in the old days when you'd had your VHS on channel three and public access, yep. <laughs> I started movie reviews and more in 1994. Nice. So I remember those. Well, I can tell, I can tell you love, you love this business. <laughs> there's, a, there's very few of us left, unfortunately. So that, but nobody has the numbers that I have. I'm even helping, um, uh, Leonard Malton and um, his daughter, because you know it's it's he's so respected, but he's lost his outlet. And I go because things have changed, so a lot of people weren't prepared for the change. Like I said, we started yeah. everything around August twenty, August fourth of twenty eighteen. So I can speak for a lot of people that can't be speaking. I don't have to worry about a network or, or a sponsors. I have my own sponsors, and they love. What I've quadrupled their business. For example, we've had our own hand sanitizers for five years. What does that tell you? I was trying to get it into Lindley's and onto cruise ships the last three years. Now they all want it. What did we need last year? Hand sanitizer. So as one yep. of the, we're <laughs> ahead of the game. So that's, again, it's my job to be able to see what's coming down the pipeline and be very, very good at that. So give you social yep. media links and then I'm going to invite you down to the studio if you have time to come. Oh, that would be great. Um, social... I think it's Stunt Women Film is on uh, Instagram, and uh, we also have a Facebook page. Uh, I think it's just Stunt. I think it's Stunt Women Film are what both of them are, and um, and I'm on I'm on both of those two myself um, on Instagram, and I'm just at April underscore Right underscore 1999, and I'm on Twitter too at Drive In Doc. So April Wright, you are the right person to come on today because I love this film. Like I said. No matter what, I'm always, I, I don't do one and done. I always have my list on our Tuesday night shows of people who are maybe book readers where I want them, hey, this film came from a book. You're an author, you never know what may come up. So, but watch this film because you may be elected to this. You may, you may be connected to it one way or another. And they like that because not a lot of people tell them which way to go. So I always lead people to where they need to go if that makes sense. That's great. Well, thank you. Thanks for, you know, talking to me and for helping to get some light on, on stunt women. It, it, it was a great film to make and, um, and I'm, you know, just so lucky to be able to tell their story. I'm not done with you yet. Next time I have you coming up <laughs> on our live Tuesday night show, you're going to meet the girls because they're going to love to hear your story and what you put together because they haven't had a chance to see it. So and I want them to see. Oh, it. great! Well, it's all good. about they gender empowerment it. and women empowerment. And like I said, our show—and I'm a male, but all I'm surrounded by women. Our show is number one on on women on TV and the worldwide TV network, which used to be called the Women's Broadcast TV Channel. 
And you'll get a kick out of this. The CEO is Shay Vaughn. Her son is Vince Vaughn. <laughs> so we can't go wrong with yeah. that. So April. That's you. awesome. That's great. I really, really appreciate it. Keep up your good work. And I want to find, um, I want to find your other two films. I need to see this because since me being a movie whore, I need to see them. <laughs> yeah, you. If you love movies, you'll love the, the other two for sure. I know. Oh, you I will. know. I'm gonna. <laughs> I love going to the drive-ins, and I haven't been able to go to one, but you know, we've been invited. So, and as I say this, if you see someone without a smile, please give them one of yours because the world needs it. I'm Brian Sebastian. April Wright, thank you, the director of The Untold Story of Stunt Woman. Thank you for coming on Movie Produce More, and we will see you next week.